This is part three of Federalist 44, starting with paragraph six. Bills of attainder, ex post facto laws, and laws impairing the obligation of contracts are contrary to the first principles of social compact and to every principle of sound legislation. The two former are expressly prohibited by the declarations prefixed, prefixed to some of the state constitutions. And all of them are prohibited by the spirit and scope of these fundamental charters. Our own experience has taught us, nevertheless, that additional offenses against these dangers ought not to be omitted. Very properly, therefore, have the Convention added this constitutional bulwark in favor of personal security and private rights. Bulwark is like a fence. And I am much deceived if they have not, in so doing, as faithfully consulted the genuine sentiments as the undoubted interest of their constituents. constituents. The sober people of America are wary of the fluctuating policy which has directed the public councils. They have seen with regret and indignation that sudden changes and legislative interferences, interferences in cases affecting personal rights become job in the hands of enterprising and influential speculators. Okay, let me mention something to you here. Job here doesn't mean the same thing as job we have now. The sense job, sometimes at that time they would use it for somebody that tries to take advantage of something that's for public good, deceive people for personal benefit. So keep that in mind. So let me read this part, part again. They have seen with regret and indignation that sudden changes and legislative interferences in cases affecting personal rights become jobs in the hands of enterprising and influential speculators and snares to the more industrious and less informed part of the community. Yeah, I, I looked it up in Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, one of the sentences they had, they had job and rob in the same sentence. Almost they, they rhymed and they were similar in that sense. So just keep that in mind. It means people taking advantage of uh, public trust for their own public, uh, for their own personal gain and personal benefit. They have seen, too, that one legislative interference is but the first link of a long chain of repetitions, every subsequent interference being naturally produced by the effects of the preceding. They very highly infer, therefore, that some thorough reform is wanting, which will banish speculations on public measures, inspire a general prudence in industry, and give a regular course to the business of society. In other words, the business situation in society becomes stable, a regular course. The prohibition with respect to the titles of nobility is copied from the Articles of Confederation and needs no comment. Two, no state shall, without the consent of the Congress, lay any imposts or duties on imports or exports except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws and the net produce of all duties and imposts laid by any state on imports or exports shall be for the use of the Treasury of the United States. And all such laws shall be subject to the revision and control of the Congress. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty on tonnage, 
keep troops on or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state or with a foreign power, or engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. The restraint on the power of states over imports and exports is enforced by all the arguments which prove the necessity of submitting the regulation of trade to the federal councils. It is needless, therefore, to remark further on this head than that the manner in which the restraint is qualified seems well calculated at once to secure the state a reasonable discretion in providing for the conveniency of their imports and exports and to the United States a reasonable check against the abuse of this discretion. The remaining particulars of this clause fall within reasonings which are either so obvious or have been so fully developed that they may be passed over without remark. Some of these I've told you before in the previous parts. So uh, I think if you listen to the introduction and also have uh, read the previous Federalist, uh, you will see an echo of it in this, in these last two paragraphs. Okay, now he goes to the sixth category. He says the sixth and the last class consists of several powers and provisions by which efficacy is given to all the rest. In other words, you give the government responsibility to do something, you have to make it be efficient. You have to give it the authority to become efficient and do what it needs to do. And then he says, one of these, the first is the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. So this is so important, I'm just going to read it to you again. One of the first is the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or office thereof. Few parts of the Constitution have been assailed with more intemperance than this. It says few parts have been attacked like this part. Yet on a fair investigation of it, as has been elsewhere shown, no part can appear more completely invulnerable. Without the substance of this power, the whole Constitution would be a dead letter. So he says if this part is not in it, the whole Constitution will be a dead letter, which is just nothing, worthless. Those who object to the article, therefore, as a part of the Constitution, can only mean that the form of the provision is improper, but have they considered whether a better form could have been sub substituted? There are four other poss possible methods which the Convention might have taken on this subject. They might have copied the second article of the existing Confederation, which would have prohibited the exercise of any power not expressly delegated. Whenever you hear the word expressly delegated, he's talking about everything has to be mentioned one by one. Every power has to be expressly given, very clearly given. They might have attempted a positive enumeration of the powers comprehended under the general terms necessary and proper. They might have attempted a negative enumeration of them by specifying the powers accepted from the general definition. They might have been altogether silent on the subject leaving these necessary and proper powers to construction and inference. So he says, Congress could have gone about this four ways, could have gone about making this necessary and proper clause. And he gives you the four different ways of doing it. And he says, look, 
we have come up with the best way in this new constitution because we've seen the weaknesses of these other methods. So uh, I will continue in the next video.